and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to walk through my garden and we're going to talk about my top 20 permaculture plants for your edible garden in a cool temperate climate. So what makes a permaculture plant a permaculture plant? Well for me one of the things I like in a permaculture plant is for them to be perennial so I can set and forget and not have to worry about it. It's really low maintenance and it's always there in the garden. I do like my plants to be multifunctional, like here on the farm, we try and have a purpose for everything, dual purpose for everything, not just a purpose, but at least two purposes. Um, for example, uh, one of the permaculture plants that's not edible, so it's not included today, but one of those plants is comfrey. I planted around my fence in my veggie patch to help um, stop the runner grass coming in. I planted at the base of my compost bin to catch that goodness and um, bring it back up into its leaves that I can chop and drop as a mulch. Um, it's medicinal. The bees love the flowers. Um, you can use it in your compost to accelerate it and you can make fertilizer from it. So it's really quite useful and has so many purposes in my garden or in a garden. The plant being drought tolerant is another great reason here. Um, we are self-sufficient in our water and while we do have water, um, access to water year round, it is nice to not have to worry about watering something. So Tagasaski trees are usually quite drought tolerant and a lot of the plants that I'm showing you today are fairly drought tolerant compared to their annual brothers and sisters. So now let's go and have a look at those 20 permaculture plants that are perfect for an edible, cool, temperate climate. plant I want to talk to you about is rhubarb. The main function of this plant is eating it really. I can produce this through winter. This is a, a rhubarb that doesn't go dormant. It's a really fantastic variety. I got it off my father-in-law so I don't name, know the variety name, I'm sorry. Um, I got it off him about 10 years ago and I took it to my first house and then I divided it and took it to my second house where I divided it and took it here and now I've got about 15 plants. It produces through winter so when not much else is producing um, it's really quite attractive I think um, <laughs> and I can plant it here where the birds used to really come and destroy everything. Um, I wanted to plant strawberries here originally but the birds would have eaten them all so we planted something that's really hardy, really drought tolerant and the birds won't um, ruin our harvest. So um, that's the reason why this has a place in my permaculture garden. On to plant number two. This is my asparagus bed. There are quite a few other things planted in here in true permaculture style, but asparagus is another um, plant that I love in my permaculture garden. It does take a few years to start producing if you're growing it from seed, which I did here. Um, but once you have it established in your garden, you can be harvesting spears for about 20 years. So it's a really fantastic perennial plant. Um, and they're really delicious. Fresh asparagus compared to anything that you could buy in the supermarket. It's so incredibly sweet and tender and tastes like fresh sweet peas. So I highly recommend you growing asparagus in your permaculture garden. On to plant number three. Plant number three in my permaculture garden is Yakon. It's a Peruvian grand apple and it's very similar to a sunflower in its flower. It is very small and they don't always flower every year. So this is planted in my, I guess you could call this ornamental garden. It's very permaculture. I've got a whole lot of plants in here. Edibles, flowers, medicinals, um, pollinator attractant plants um, but yakon doesn't really look like an edible plant but underground it grows these enormous tubers that are sweet and crisp and for me they are ready in June to August when there's not much happening in my garden because it's the middle of winter it is winter they are ready in winter and 
while I can grow in my garden through winter, it's much slower and the variety, you know, it's not amazing. A lot of greens and greens and greens. So to have something sweet and crisp and delicious, it's perfect timing. So I highly recommend Yacon or Yacon or Peruvian Grand Apple in your permaculture garden. On to plant number four. This is plant number four. It's just emerging out of its dormancy and it's lovage. Lovage is a herb but it's very very similar to celery and I use it in its place. And the great thing about lovage is that it grows during the summer months when celery would usually bolt and run to seed. So lovage resists bolting. Um, it does die off through winter but it'll come back every um, late spring to early summer. So it's a fantastic herb. <laughs> Thanks Rex. So we think... <laughs> Rex! <laughs> so we think it's a fantastic plant to have in your permaculture garden. <laughs> because it can replace celery when you can't grow celery. We're in my hot house because plant number five is still growing. I have a couple out in my veggie patch already, but they're only little. And this is Rokoto chili. It is a perennial chili. It will survive in your garden for about seven years. My mum had one of these when I was growing up. One of her friends gave us some chilies. And we kept the seeds and we grew them. And I know they were Rokoto because they had black seeds inside them. They're a great plant and they can be grown in cool climates, even though chilies and capsicums and eggplants usually die here if I don't bring them into my hothouse. These can be overwintered outside if they're kept in a fairly sheltered area. So I've got these in that tank patch that um, I showed you the Yacons at. Um, it has a little bit of a heat bank there with the concrete tank and it's protected from frost and winds. So I envision that to stay in my garden for many years to come without needing to dig it up and overwinter it in my hothouse, which I do with my other chilies because they are perennial too, but these ones are the best ones for your cool temperate climate. And on to plant number six. I can't show you plant number six in my garden yet because it's still emerging, but that is scarlet runner beans. These are also known as the seven year bean. So you plant them once and they form a tuber underground and each spring and summer they'll reshoot and they'll grow another vine. So I love set and forgets. They're a great bean that you can eat fresh but also dried. Fantastic permaculture plant. And now we're on to plant number seven. Plant number seven are chives. I have two types of chives in my garden, onion chives, which you can see behind me, and garlic chives. And these are fantastic, they are both perennial. The onion chives usually die back, the garlic chives don't die back. Um, but the bees adore the flowers. They're fantastic to use in salads and egg dishes um, and potato dishes. Um, I really enjoy using them for a really fresh pop of flavour and they're continually growing and continually covered in bees. So I highly recommend growing chives in your permaculture garden. They can be ornamental, like they are in my ornamental garden, and they can be in your veggie patch too. You can pop them anywhere and they look beautiful. These here are the garlic chives. They would work really well to keep runner grass out of your garden as a border. They do flower as well, but they usually flower later in summer but there they are forming a beautiful border for one of my permaculture beds. Now onto plant number eight. These guys are alpine strawberries and they form an integral part in my veggie patch down here. They are one of my border plants around my gardens. <laughs> they are highly, highly productive. They grow easily from seed. They clump, don't run, the kids adore them. They come down here daily and get handfuls and handfuls of strawberries. Because they're white, the birds don't see them, so I don't get pest pressure like I do with my red regular strawberries. They're delicious. <laughs> the bees love them. 
and I think they look really pretty here as a border in my garden. So if you don't grow alpine strawberries, I highly recommend that you do. These are one of our absolute favourites. <laughs> Plant number nine in my permaculture garden would be artichokes. They are beautiful, so they don't just need to be in your veggie patch. They're in my ornamental garden here. They're delicious if you know how to prepare them right. And they are stunning when they flower and the bees absolutely adore them. I highly recommend these, not just for your permaculture garden, but for your ornamental garden too. Plant number 10 in my permaculture garden is sorrel. It is such a beautiful plant and it's delicious. It's really lemony. It's a great addition to salads. It does have some oxalate acids in it, so don't eat too many, but if you want something that's beautiful and functional, this is certainly it. It's a green that's perennial. It will last all year round. Um, it can tend to die back in the cooler weather, but it will regrow. And if it does form seeds, it will reseed. So you can collect the seeds and plant it through your garden. I have it here as a bit of a border, a bit of an edge in my garden, a bit of a pop of color that's edible and a green. <laughs> On to the next plant. Number 11 and 12 are conveniently located next to each other. Number 11 is this perennial rocket, which has actually gone to seed. It self seeds profu profusely, um, but also stays alive um, through it all. So they are very peppery, much more peppery compared to regular rocket. But I find rocket a pain in the butt to grow. It always bolts on me every single time, no matter what time of year I plant it. No matter where I plant it, it always bolts straight away. And this will obviously flower and go to seed once a year, which is fine. But um, it continues to produce um, leaves that I can pick and pop into salad mixes. I wouldn't just eat rocket, this rocket, perennial rocket, because it is a bit peppery. But um, mixed in with other stuff, it's completely fine and much, much easier, in my opinion, to grow than regular rocket. Number 12 is Cape Gooseberry. This, I think this is considered a bit of a, bit of a pest in places because it does self-seed um, very easily. The birds can get to them and then take them elsewhere and then they grow, they love our climate and grow, grow here really well. I have seen it in the bush tucker book um, as a bush tucker food, but I don't think it's native to Australia. Something I should double check maybe, but um, the first time I grew this, um, it ended up dying in our frosts and I thought they weren't going to be very hardy. So I grew a heap from seed last year and they all survived and they all survived heavy, heavy frost, especially this one here in this location. It wasn't affected at all by the frost and it's flowered super early now because this time last year it was still growing. Um, it was flowering a little bit, but it wasn't an established plant. Um, it's flowering profusely and it's got so much fruit on it um, that we'll be harvesting fruit really really soon from this. Um, I really like this because of the papery husks around them. I'll pick one off. Um, oops, run away. Um, these papery husks around the fruit protect it uh, and they do protect them from birds most of the time and other insects. Um, although some do get away, like I said before. Um, they turn yellow, those little berries inside, and they're okay fresh, but I really love them dried. Um, they're known as Inca berries, I believe, when they're, um, when they're dried. So yeah, I don't think they are from Australia. I think they're from South America originally. Um, fantastic dried, they're really sour and sweet, and they're kind of like a Skittle. Um, and we all fight over them. <laughs> So I, I really enjoy this um, for its dried fruit. Um, and we're growing so many of these just so we can dehydrate a cupboard full <laughs> for use through winter as, um, you know, addition to muesli or just a snack as they are. But really, really, really love Cape gooseberries. And you can save the seed and propagate as many plants as you want or yeah, just leave the ones that you've got. 
I would imagine that I'm going to get quite a few pop up in my veggie patches that I grew them in last year. Um, I haven't noticed any yet, but um, I could see it becoming a little bit pesty um, if you left it unchecked. But um, so far, I'm really, really happy with this and it's going to have a forever spot in my veggie patch. <laughs> This is plant number 13 and it's just emerging from dormancy. It's a cucumelon and so this is much like the scarlet runner bean where you plant it once and it forms a tuber underground and it will re-sprout in the warmer weather. They produce delicious little um, cucumbers that are very sour. They're kind of supposed to taste like pickles that aren't pickled yet. Um, they're the size of a grape. They look like little baby watermelons. They're very cute and they're very delicious and I highly recommend them. The kids adore them, which is another bonus. So that is plant number 13 in my permaculture garden. Plant number 14 in my permaculture garden, hi Rex, <laughs> are perennial onions and leeks. I have several types of perennial onions in my garden that aren't just the chives. So I've got these potato onions, I've got these walking onions, I've got, oh, I've forgotten the name. I've got another onion, which I'll insert the name here. <laughs> I've got a perennial leek that um, makes offsets and you take the offsets and you plant those. So this is the perennial leek I was talking to you about. Um, when it's ready to divide, um, it, you see it's got a little bit of a bulb there. I'm not sure if you can see that. Let me pick you up. There's a little bit of a bulb there and it will grow all these off, um, offsets, all these shoots from the side. And you just divide them, you dig it up, you divide them, and you plant out the little babies, and then you can use this big one in the middle. So I really like that they grow offshoots, little babies. Much easier to grow them from seed, although I still grow onions from seed because we use a lot of onions. This is the other onion I was telling you about that I can't remember the name of. These are the same, these are potato onions. I planted one and they've divided. They're called potato onions because they divide. Um, and so now I've got three instead of one and I can divide them later in the year and grow some more plants. I am going to research if I can grow them from seed um, because they are about to flower. And then the last one was this walking onion and basically this one grows these, um, I don't know what you'd call those, there's kind of offsets but in the air. And basically it'll get too heavy and it'll start to fall over. That's why it's called walking because it'll land in the ground and these will grow um, new bunches of onions and here you can see the onions that it's forming there so that was one plant um, that I bought and now I'm going to be able to divide it and get plenty of plants from that so this is why we love permaculture plants because they do all the work for you this plant here is Jerusalem artichokes also known as sunchokes, kind of like a sunflower. I think they're related somewhere down the line and they have a similar flower again to the sunflower, just a small understated yellow flower, um, but they are there. And while it's not technically a perennial, basically once you plant Jerusalem artichokes, you're gonna have it there for life. I thought I removed them completely from an area, but they've actually come back this year and they've come back really nicely. So um, I'm happy with that. They're in a perfectly fine area there. Um, they're in my orchard, um, so it's a little bit harder to harvest them, which is why I planted them here along my fence to hide my corrugated iron fence. Had a little bit of beauty because they are lush and gorgeous. Um, the bees will love the flowers when they do pop open, and the tubers again are harvested in winter time. Um, they're, when you slow cook them in the oven or fry them in a little bit of oil, they become really chewy. And caramelized and I really like that but you can't eat too many because they are high in fiber I've never had an issue our family's never had an issue but some people do have an issue with the high fiber content um, I think they're really wonderful here interplanted with my yacons um, and I've got some sunflowers here too but um, mainly these perennial or kind of like perennial plants if you like them if you think you can tolerate them they are great to have in your perennial garden this here is a pepino and it's basically a perennial melon. It's almost like a rock melon and mine's a little bit sheltered because we do get heavy frost here 
but it hasn't missed a beat. I think I could even plant this in other parts of my garden without it being affected by frost and possibly snow um, when we get it on the odd occasion. But it's very prolific. It's a great ground cover and it produces melons about that big um, through the winter months, which is the best part about it. We um, can grow melons here. It is a little bit difficult, but they're ready in summer. But these ones are ready when not much else is. And if you haven't noticed, there's a bit of a theme there. That most of my permaculture plants are ready in winter when the garden, or the annuals in my garden, aren't producing very well. Number 17 is a tamarillo tree. This is a tree tomato. And you do need to give this a little bit of protection from frost, but as you can see, it doesn't miss a beat. This one, something I was taught in my permaculture design course was that once a tree gets above frost level, about a meter and a half, that it's not really going to be affected so much by frost anymore. So this tree um, should be fine. It produces fruit when not much else is in July, August, September, but it's still fruiting now and I'm getting another flush of flowers. Let's see if we can have a look at those. Let's get another flush of flowers up there with some fruit sets. So that should be ready in a few months time, so maybe the end of summer. Um, so I'm actually getting two flushes of fruit from this, but it's a really beautiful tree. It can go nicely in an ornamental garden. It's got nice height, nice structure. It's got the long, tall stem with that beautiful bushy top. Um, I think this would look wonderful in a flower or ornamental garden. And then you've got these beautiful ornamental fruits. Now these come in yellow as well as red. Um, but that one there is nearly ready to be picked. Um, and they aren't, like they're not my favourite fruit, but everyone else in my family loves them. I'm the only one who isn't, you know, raving about them. They're, they're okay. Everyone else loves them, so maybe it's just me. My next tree is rather hidden. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to point it out to you because this bed is full. But it's this tree here, it's a babaco tree, and it's going to grow much the same as that tamarillo that I just showed you. Um, it is also known as a mountain pawpaw or papaya. I've had this before. Um, I had a piece of fruit given to me. It's also known as champagne fruit. It's got a mild... Where are we? A mild, sweet flavour. It's nice and long like a papaya, but it's um, light in colour. But I think that will look beautiful here as well as the tamarillo. I've got that one here and I've got another seedling tamarillo planted back here. So I think those beautiful big trees will look lovely, especially out of my land room window. So their purpose is to provide us fruit in the winter time or the other times that aren't other fruits aren't as productive and look beautiful in this area. The next plant here is perennial basil. Most herbs are perennials but a few things are annuals and one of those is basil. And while this isn't while this doesn't have a true basil flavour, it's more minty basil y um, it does produce through winter. So if I do want to make a curry that calls for basil, um, this is perfect to go in it. Uh, I probably wouldn't make a pesto with it. Um, I, I don't think the minty flavour would really work, but um, it is lush, beautiful, drought tolerant, um, and the bees love the flowers. Um, the only thing to note here is that it does run like mint. So if you don't want it all through your garden, um, contain it to a pot or somewhere else that you don't mind it running. Um, I've got an embankment here that I want a few things to cover. It's not gonna run up the embankment, but it will hold this slope together, hopefully if it runs there, um, and I don't mind it um, going wild here, basically. <laughs> this here is horseradish. Now, a word of warning on this. This grows much like comfrey, and once you plant it somewhere, you're gonna have it there for life. It grows from really small root cuttings. So I've actually tried to get rid of this from this bed because it's really hard to harvest it. Um, because it is a raised narrow bed, um, I just find it really hard to get a fork in here and I think it struggles to get really nice deep tap roots. So I do have some in other parts of the farm, but basically it will die back through winter and then it'll regrow in spring. And you, you can eat the leaves, um, but you're mainly growing it for the root. The root 
mines that mineral so if you want to you can chop and drop it like comfrey it's the bioaccumulator um, and yeah the roots are highly medicinal they're really great for your immune system you can use it in your fire ciders um, and basically that's the only reason why I grow it because I don't really like it on steak some people like it on steak it's not my thing but I grow it for its medicinal value and its bioaccumulation value this plant here is my bonus plant it's not technically a perennial but I did plant this here last year so it's been in the ground for 12 months and even though we had heavy frost it didn't kill the plant and if it did kill the plant it set enough seeds that basically I'll have nasturtiums here forever but all parts of the plant are edible the flowers are great in salads they're very peppery and the leaves are great to wrap up food or have a little holder also very peppery you can probably add them to salads too but it's nice to put use that um, as a gluten-free wrap or something like that and the seeds they can be pickled and used as a caper substitute they're actually called poor man's capers so you can see why why this plant made my bonus list i hope you guys enjoyed this video and you guys discovered some new plants to put in your permaculture cool temperate garden i'll see you guys next time bye